Welcome to the Less Doing Podcast, where you will learn how to start living more by doing less. Let me help you optimize, automate, and outsource your entire life so you can focus on doing the things you love. Now here's your host, Ari Mizell. Hey everyone, it's Ari. So the episode you're about to hear now was recorded live and raw, it is unedited, at our recent Less Doing Los Angeles event. The event included about 50 amazing entrepreneurs, many of whom are in the Less Doing Leaders coaching program. We had world-class speakers and the theme of the event was perfect your process. So we had experts across several different genres and every talk was given as a fireside chat style conversation. So again, they're unedited. They're, these episodes are explicit. We are an explicit podcast, but these were uh, a little more explicit in some cases than others. So fair warning. And if you want to find out more about what we do at a Less Doing Live event, after you listen to this episode, go to lessdoing.com and click on our live events button. Now enjoy the episode. All right, so here we are, Let's Doing Live, day two, last uh, session of the day with my, my dear, dear friend, George Bryant. Wow. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah. The civilized caveman, as we sit here drinking our, Not our reds. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Got fired. I did. Um, so, uh, George, how, how did we meet, actually? I don't even know. Uh, I was a leverage client. Oh, yeah, that right. And I was pissed. Yeah. <laughs> and you got on the call. Yeah. I said, I don't want to talk to Nick. I want to talk to you. <laughs> and then we became friends. Yeah. There yeah. you go. So customer service uh, <laughs> is really what brought us together. <laughs> it's really what brought us together. It's funny, actually, um, just as a, a sort of general note, <laughs> anytime I answer almost any communication, about half the time people are like, this isn't really Ari, right? Which I can use to my advantage. Um, people never think it's me. They always think it's a bot or a VA. So um, anyway. It wasn't me. So uh, George is, uh, in my opinion, the uh, the most brilliant marketing mind I've ever encountered, uh, and I and I don't mean that in a, a hyperbolic way at all. Uh, he says things that are very mind blowing, and that uh, some of them are the some of it's like the kind of thing where oh it sounds really simple, but holy shit, I never thought of that. Other ones, it's like how the hell did you come up with that? Um, and I can give some specific examples as we talk through this, but. For those of you who don't know George's background and story, uh, it I think it's worth sharing. In terms, I always I'll point out, and I actually meant to say this earlier in the day, earlier in the day, that uh, I always believe that uh, if you want to learn from successful people, don't look at what they do or how they do it. Look at how they think, or that's what I always want. I want to know how they think, and that's should have hopefully come through with the conversations that I've had with all of our speakers at the event. I don't really care like, oh, you built this thing or you did that. I mean, it's interesting, but I want to know how they think, why they think through it that way and how you approach things. So um, having said that, it, it's always valuable to me to know where somebody's come from so that informs the way they think. So where'd you come from? It's a good question. <clears throat> the shortest version of this is um, I grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, my amazing brother's in the room too. And uh, we didn't have like the most glorious childhood. I, Joe and I are like twins with a big age gap. Um, and so we had a, quite frankly, pretty shitty childhood. And uh, it was a lot of survival, a lot of resiliency. And I knew if I stayed, I'd be dead. Uh, chose not to get into drugs or anything, just chose to do the opposite and work my ass off. Had three jobs when I was in high school, in and out of the psych ward. And uh, I forged my father's signature to join the Marine Corps. It's a smart thing to do. Um, <clears throat> leave no structure to go all the way into structure. Um, but I was fat, uh, I was bulimic, I had been sexually abused. And so when I was 17, I forged a signature, I had to lose 45 pounds to go. They let me go to boot camp. Napoleon Complex took over, went to boot camp, graduated first out of 1,600 recruits at boot camp, went to Marine Combat Training, graduated first, went to MOS school, graduated first, got myself meritorious promoted and straight to a fucking deployment within <laughs> 12 months of being in. And so uh, in 2004, I was in Mogadishu in Somalia. Um, that was a humbling experience. 
um, to say the least. I don't ever say um, but that place sucked. And on my 21st birthday, while I was there, I almost lost both my legs. So I got what's called exercise-induced compartment syndrome. I weighed 225 pounds, had 100 pounds of combat gear on. Uh, it was 130 fucking degrees in a place where they burn bodies at night. And uh, it was hell. And on my 21st birthday, I almost lost my legs. Ended up having some emergency surgeries. Came home, spent 12 months in a wheelchair. Gained 100 pounds, became addicted to narcotics, a PCA pump, morphine, Vicodin, hydrocodone, like 20, 30 a day just to function. My bulimia spun out of control, sex addiction spun out of control, uh, attempted suicide by overdosing on pills, and I woke up the next morning feeling glorious. And I was like, okay. And then um, made a full recovery uh, when they told me they were going to kick me out, and I was scared to go home. So I ended up uh, making a full recovery. They told me they were going to amputate my legs, and I quite frankly said, fuck you. Um, ended up tying a world record for a standing box jump, did an Ironman, ran a triathlon, marathon. Uh, then our dad got sick, lost him to cancer. <laughs> then I ended up in Afghanistan seven months later. And over the course of three years, I ended up with seven concussions. Uh, in three years, traumatic brain injury, bleeding on my brain, fluid on my brain, uh, pretty bad PTSD. Uh, witnessed three suicides. I've lost 21 Marines. And uh, I was going to spend my life in the Marine Corps. I didn't know anything else. It was just a place of survival and safety and structure. And uh, it basically fed my ego and paradigm and my not good enough story. And then uh, I was in Afghanistan and I started CrossFit. I found uh, one of Tim Ferriss's book, one of Rob Wolf's book, uh, and it was on paleo. And I was struggling heavily with my bulimia. I was purging in porta potties in Afghanistan. Nobody knew. And after I lost my dad, I, I didn't. I didn't want to be dead or broken or however I saw myself. And I said, I'm going to beat this. So when I came home, I said, I'm going to teach myself how to cook. And so I picked five recipes I found online that were paleo, and I said, I'm going to cook every day. And I don't want to tell anybody I have an eating disorder, but I'm going to post online every single day so I have accountability outside of myself. Um, I didn't know what a blog was. I had no idea. I did it all on a Facebook page. And I came up with the most brilliant, easy to remember business name ever. Uh, Civilized Caveman Cooking Creations. Easy to spell. Easy to remember. Good domain name. Um, and I just documented the whole thing. And um, I kept going. I kept going. Uh, built a Facebook page. And someone's like, you should post these on a blog. And I'm like, what's a blog? And they're like, go to blogger.com. And I'm like, cool. Built a blogger.com and then the Marine Corps said, hey, we're kicking you out. You're no longer fit for duty. And um, quite frankly, my asshole puckered up and I had no idea what I was gonna do. My benefits gone, my pay gone, no retirement out the door. And I'm like, screw it, I'm gonna figure this out. So in 2010, I, uh, I made an ebook. I took every recipe that I'd cooked and put it in a Word document. Didn't even know how to save it as a PDF and I sold it on ClickBank and made a million bucks in like four months with a fucking Word document. So uh, I'm successful because I'm stupid, basically. And that's a really good thing. And then that kind of spiraled and said, okay, I'm gonna keep doing this. And I focused and I ended up building Civilized Caveman to five million uniques a month, a couple hundred thousand social media fans. Um, then I decided to turn the ebook into an app. So I went on YouTube and taught myself how to build apps, just like I taught myself how to cook. We launched an app, hit number one in the world. Uh, got featured by Apple as the top health app of 2015. So then the next thing is like, oh, I should write a fucking cookbook, because that's what you do. Someone's like, well, how are you gonna do it? I'm like, well, I'm gonna teach myself photography and I'm gonna find a publisher. So I did, took 18,000 photographs, designed a marketing plan, which I didn't know was a marketing plan at the time. Uh, my email list was 11,000 people when I launched my book and I hit number four in the world and became a 22 week New York Times bestseller. I sold 181,000 copies. Um, that was a pretty big deal. And then I kept going. And then a couple years ago, I realized I fucking hate cooking. And it's really, really hard to be a New York Times bestselling cookbook author and not like cooking. Uh, and I was with Tucker at the time. I was at Jim Quick's house. And uh, they asked me a question about Facebook. And I went on a four hour tangent. And Tucker's like, you should probably teach this to people. I was like, how? And he's like, say you're a consultant. I'm like then what? He's like, pick a number. So that was the day I started consulting. And um, since then, I've gotten married. I have a beautiful family. I have an 18, 19 month old son who's very opinionated and the boss. 
have a 13 year old bonus daughter and I've now been doing digital marketing strategy and consulting for the last two years to Adidas, Reebok, Title is Taylor made on it, Vital Proteins and a whole slew of stuff there and that's how I got here. Nice. Yeah. I'm gonna, take a, I'm gonna take a sip of wine. Yeah. <laughs> and I've done a shit ton of work to be able to talk about this stuff from EMDR to MDMA to I play in the plant world too, so changed my life. So that that's where we are. That that got me to this point. Okay. So <laughs> um there's like six different ways I want to go with this one. Uh, okay. We have no time cap. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't pinpoint how you do things differently, like mm -hmm. in my head, but I know that you do, mm -hmm. and everything, when you always, your approach to this stuff is always very different, and it, I, I don't think you would say this, but it would be too easy for you to just be like, I didn't know any better, so this is how I did it. Mm -hmm. There is, there's a, there's a, there's a method to the madness, right? There's a method there behind the magic. <clears throat> there is. Um, so, what, where does that come from? Uh, to be completely frank about it, um, I'm going to say I'm self-aware, which means I'm not self-aware, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to pretend to be self-aware. Uh, it comes out of a need to, to feed my paradigm, to feed my not good enough story. And I choose to harness that for the power of good. Uh, you know, my whole life was not good enough from the sexual abuse to the parents. And like, I have earliest memories of like three years old feeling like worthless. And uh, I have this very selfish mission to help a billion people. And the way I do that is by giving to everybody else or creating situations and um, products and systems and things that make people feel safe and help them be better versions of themselves. And so when I look at situations, when I think about marketing, um, there's only one thing I think about and it's relationships. And it really, really does come out of a place of pain. And I just choose to find the positive in it, you know, deal with the feelings that I'm having in that moment and choose something different. And I think about how people feel on every step of every ad, on every email, on every page, on every image, on every photo, and on everything. And I understand that on the other side of that computer is somebody who is putting themselves out there and trusting us through a digital connection because they are looking for an answer or hope and they need to feel safe to take an action to change their life. And so I make that the core and the basis of everything that I do. That everybody feels valuable whether they give us a credit card or not. Right, which is uh, one of the things that, that you taught me that I really like, which is that there's there's uh, no one left behind, right? No so one. there's there's a place for everyone. Everyone comes home or you die trying, and that includes in your marketing. And if not, close the fucking doors to your business and don't talk to me. I, I stand by that all day. We have a moral responsibility when we decide to become an expert or a guru or sell a product that even if somebody doesn't take action on that product or buy that product, that we leave their lives better than when they found. Because if we don't, we are contributing to a massive problem that exists and we don't know what that effect has and the butterfly effect that comes out. When somebody quite frankly feels guilty, bad, wrong, or shameful when they decided to put themselves on the line and they didn't get what they needed. So and, and so, let's talk about that a little bit in practice, right? So uh, I, need to, I need to calm down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, we're else? good. No, we're good. Okay. So I mean, you told me about you know uh, multiple dozen uh, email sequences, you know, for the uh -huh. people that didn't answer you. Yeah. Right. So it's 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 obsessive. It's, it's not, yeah. It's insanely obsessive. Insanely obsessive. Yeah. I. I, I have this I have this theory, thesis, if you will. Well, it's actually not a hypothesis anymore. It's been proven. But we live in this world in digital marketing where it's really easy to make a shit ton of money on the internet. Um, and what I found through the years, and this is because, and, and it's not that I'm, I say like I'm only successful because I'm stupid, but what I mean by that is not that I'm self-deprecating. It's that I didn't have a context of what marketing should look like. I had no idea. Like, no box to fit it in, no class, no degrees, no nothing. All I knew in my entire life is that I created results for people and primarily my Marines by giving a shit about them and not giving a shit about the opinions of my bosses. And so they were always number one, which is why I had like 11, page 11s and I was still promoted all the way up. They loved me, my bosses hated me. And so I look at customers um, the same exact way and when I think about what we do in this world, we're like, all right, cool, like we launched this funnel, we do this ad, 
what's our break even? All right, if I average a 1.8x ROAS on my Facebook ads, then I'm break even. So now all I have to do is add 100 more people and for every four I get, my front end offers break even and then I'm gonna make my money back on the back end. And we live where we perpetuate this and it, it's taught everywhere and it drives me batshit insane because number one, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money and it's a waste of energy because you have a bucket with a 90% hole in the bottom and you're trying to put more water in it. And I'm like, if you just simply pick up the fucking phone and call the people that didn't buy and ask them why, you're gonna convert that 95% into a customer or more importantly, into a raving fan of the business and 82% of marketing is still done word of mouth. And so trial closes may be not a thing and all the psychological bullshit and NLP, but what I do know is that I would rather have 95% of people saying yes to me than 95% of people saying no to me. And so when I look at 100 people that come through a funnel or a system or a product, we always do really good most of the time at taking care of the 5% of people that buy. Like, oh, we're gonna nurture them, we're gonna put them in this fulfillment sequence and we're gonna upsell them. Let's suppress them for 45 days and we'll sell them this, this, this. And we plan out their entire life. And then the one person who needed us to take a stand for them and say like, hey, I know you weren't ready right now, but just wait a week, doesn't get any of our attention. They get kicked to the curb and we're like, oh, let's get 100 more so we can get five more. And I've spent the last couple of years with all my clients, myself included, focusing on that 95% and working very, very hard to serve them, learn from them, or create a solution that supports them. And it's been monumentally transformational for my business and other people's businesses. And one particular example, and since this is on the internet, I won't say their name, but a couple smart people in here can figure out who it is. We came in, I came into a company and they were doing $115,000 a month, which is amazing. It's been 11 months and we just passed 6.4 million a month on the same ad budget with the same acquisition model. And all we did is we spent a month designing every individual ounce of a personalized customer journey from in-doc sequences to welcome sequences to segmentation to make sure that when somebody came in that we did our due diligence to give them what they needed based on their actions, their demographics, or what they needed. And it literally single-handedly changed the business. I, and it's, when you start talking about it, and again, you know, obviously we talk about this a lot, but I, my initial thing is like, well, you must just be really, really empathetic, right? But that actually, it really doesn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. No, I just feel like it's responsible business. Like more than anything, like, because the military is an example just for me like we never went out assuming the mission was going to succeed we had a plan and then we had 17 backup plans because shit always hits the fan we spend 13 months 12 months doing workouts to get to a country to then that one convoy on month seven of a seven and a half month deployment when you don't plan for it you walk out shit hits the fan and everybody dies and so that ingrained in me to just think about all the different situations and scenarios and understand that like these people, even though they might not have bought the product, they still chose us. They still clicked on us. They clicked on our ad. They went to our website. We pixeled them. We got their email address. And what they're saying is like, hey, I trust you. I want you to help me, but we have to do the work to give them the space to step into that, to make a choice to trust our company, to join our mastermind, to buy our digital product, to buy our book, so they can have the results that they're seeking. It's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, and if you don't want it, don't own a fucking business. Mm -hmm. Like, I I'm sorry, and like he talked about it earlier, like we get people on the internet, and I don't care if you run like a faceless brand and something like that, but if you're gonna put stuff out and you're gonna like sell courses and sell things, you're like, here you go, and you get somebody enrolled and it doesn't like complete their story. Like if Joe launched a fucking addiction podcast and all he did was agitate people's insecurities and then they had nowhere to go, like we would be creating an epidemic and like further enhancing people's problems and making it all worse. And so if we're gonna do it, if we're gonna put it out there, we have the responsibility to ensure that everybody is taken care of all the way through or else we shouldn't do it. We have no space in the game. Um, and uh, Joe, actually, what is it that, that like do you always define marketing and selling? Like it's it's um, showing somebody something that they want or that they need in an ethical way, or sell them what they want and you give them what they need. What I do is I try to sell people what they want and give them what they need. You know, 
the same reason they have like Flintstone vitamins to make yeah. it taste like candy so you can, uh, so there's different <clears throat> ways to step people into stuff. No, but the, there's the thing about sales being like evil, right? And how, and so, oh, but it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, a lot of people think, well, selling could be used in evil ways. It depends on the intent. But, you know, yeah. my favorite definition of selling is Dan uh, Solomon, which is get people intellectually engaged in the future result that's good for them, because the key word is good for them. That's what I'm Yeah. Them to emotionally commit to take action to achieve that result. And this is why we see it. It's all, about, it's all about intention, right? Selling is serving, right? Like, if somebody doesn't invest in something, they're not going to take it seriously. And that doesn't mean it always has to be that way, but they can invest their time, they can invest their money, they can invest their attention. Even if people come into your free courses for your free lead magnets, you have to remember that they're taking 11 minutes away from their children to read your shit. It better improve upon the silence. Legit. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and you know, we've heard of several people, and I believe it too, that like you should be giving a lot of free stuff and talking talks about your free stuff being better than most people's paid stuff. So, yeah, like, they, I but, love that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, they, and, jo and Jordan nailed it too. It's just, it's just the law of reciprocity, right? Like, the way that I look at it, the way I look at email marketing, social media, advertising, any paid media, is my job is always to make four deposits for every one withdrawal. Like, that's how I look mm -hmm. at reciprocity. So, like, when, like, when Luke, is like coming into my funnel, I'm like, hey, listen, like, I got you, I got your pain point, I know what it is, I have a solution. I'm like, here it is, I just need you to give me your email address. So I have this transaction. But then this is what pisses me off. I got you to commit to me and I asked you to do something, but then as soon as I get you, I then ask you to do something else and then something else without ever filling the bank again. I ask you to whitelist me, add my fucking thing to your email address. Oh wait, watch this video before you get your free ebook that you committed to. Rather than looking at it like a relationship, I can only ask my wife to do a couple things before I gotta make a couple deposits to earn the right to ask again, right? That's the reason I'm good at marketing is because I have a good marriage. Well, I'm working towards that. But because I work towards it is why I'm good at marketing. Um, so instead, I look at those things and sometimes I, I launch lead magnets and I don't even make you give me your email address. Because I'm like, I believe in what I'm giving you so much that when it makes a difference for you, you will come find me or you will opt into the link that's in the ebook or you will watch the first video and wait the nine minutes required for even the free opt-in button to come in. And I'm doing segmentation at scale. I'm making sure that it's making a difference in your life. I'm not bombarding your email address. But basically what I'm saying is like, hey, here we go. You trust me. I ask you to do something. And before I ask you to do something else, I give to you one, two, three more times. And then I'm like, hey, I've earned the right to ask you to take another action. Well, so one, uh, I said I'd share some specifics. There was one strategy that, that uh, can I show yeah, the, please. the application? Oh, but, that one was a good one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so we were doing, I, I've done, I don't know, half, maybe half a dozen or maybe 10 <laughs> webinars now. Uh, not a lot, I mean, but more than one. Um, and one of the webinars that we do is for the Optimized Operator course, which is a $1,500 <laughs> course. And with webinars, $1,500 is almost at the limit where you can sort of sell it on the spot usually at the book call or something. George had the suggestion that instead of selling it, basically we tell people to, to fill out an application at the end. That was the close, it's filling out application. And just for filling out the application, they got our $47 video that the school was doing, which is a gift just for filling it out. Uh, and, but I, I said on the webinar, I was like, you can't buy it today. Like I taught you a whole bunch of stuff. Like you fill out an application, we'll see if you're a, a good fit, but just for filling it out, we'll give you this thing. And it worked really, really well. Eight out of 10. Yeah. Eight out of 10. 80%. Yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you could, and you were selling it before, right? And it was mm -hmm. fine. And you were converting 15, 17%. And like, that's completely fine too. But I was like, what? It's you, right? And like, you can get somebody on the phone and you can help them make sure it's a good fit. It doesn't have to be a yes. And you don't have to buy. But we made sure it was a good fit. Or in this case, you made sure it was a good fit. And every time somebody got on the phone with you, they're like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. They felt safe. Right, and that's something I teach across everybody and everybody should write this down. There's three things that you need for people to do on the internet, in life, in person, in relationships to change. Number one is permission. Number two is safety. And then number three is accountability in that specific order. You have to create permission, make them feel safe, and then hold them accountable so they can create a different result. And this applies everywhere. This applies to blog posts, this applies to ebooks, videos, paid media, programs, anything. It's just the art of enrollment. 
That's all it is, is you're basically standing for someone to get them enrolled in their vision. So when they invest their time, their dollars, or their energy, that they can create the result that they are really ultimately seeking. What is, uh, what is, you don't have to get into too much specific necessarily, but like, what is that, uh, that sort of sequence look like? What is the language like for the people who don't engage? Yeah, I, I've shared that, a, I've shared that a couple times with people. Like the way that I look at it is, um, like, I'm going to be really frank. I don't know why civilized cavemen got the legs that it got, but I've gotten feedback that everybody said that it did what it did because I used it as a platform to just be unapologetically authentic. Like, unapologetically. I talked about sexual abuse. I talked about bulimia. I talked about my Marine Corps career, my marriage, my kids, my inadequacies, how I saw myself as broken. Like, and there's people reading that being like, I just want a fucking banana bread yes. recipe. Yes. <laughs> and then I was like, you think you want a banana bread, but there's only so many ways you can make it. And yet you're still seeking out new recipes every single day because you don't trust yourself, you don't believe yourself, or you think another new fucking gluten-free brownie is gonna change your life. No, we need to get to why you're eating a gluten-free brownie and eating the entire pan of them so we can change your life. But I, I just used it as an opportunity and I was like, you know what, Like, I don't know if this is right. It was uncomfortable, it hurt every day. I've been through 12 steps, I've been going for a long time. I, like, I've been through all of it and I, I knew that like the best way that I created results and change for myself, and I'm very owning of this, everything I do in marketing, on my business, my websites, and even my consulting is just my therapy. I am addicted to hearing myself talk. I created a job that I get paid a lot of money to hear myself speak. It's amazing. And I don't run away from that. I own that. I tell everybody. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I realize I just made you feel unheard. And it's because I was too connected or concerned about my ego and how you see me. So give me a minute. Let me ask you a question. Right? But that creates permission for people. They're like, whoa. Holy shit. Like, he said it. I can say it, or I can say it, or I can self-acknowledge, or I can admit what's going on. Yeah, what's up, John? Yeah, no, no like, um, it's Thank you. what you're just saying. It's like people don't buy from you because they understand what you do. People buy from you because they feel understood. Yes. When you can get that. Yeah, yeah. And like, when I look at it, like, I have imposter syndrome like the best of them. Like, all day. I can't wait till we get coffee. <laughs> We're gonna have to record that one, Doug. Um, I have it all day. Like I, I, I gotta be honest, like when the CEO of Adidas hired me, I was a consultant for four weeks. And I was like, oh fuck, here we go. And he hired me sitting on an airplane in Chicago airport on a 12 hour flight delay because we were sitting next to each other. And uh, this is a pretty funny story, I've told Ari before. <laughs> so I'm sitting in first class, I have a blue mohawk, I'm covered in tattoos. I got flannel pajama pants on. I got Reebok shoes, like CrossFit shoes on and a massive hoodie. That's my uniform, right? Like, I don't, I don't fit in in this business world. I wore a uniform for 12 years, I'm done. And the guy totally baited me, like totally fucking baited me. I was sitting there and we had literally been on the plane for like eight hours because it was like lightning and we didn't get to get off the plane. We went through three, cra three captains and two flight crews. And I was like, fuck it, I'm working. And I had a new client at the time and I was, literally in their Facebook ad account. And we were spending at the time $6 million a month on ads, just on Facebook. And so I had it open and the guy was like looking at my screen, right? And he just sees like 30 days, 6 million bucks. And he's like, what do you do? <laughs> and I was like, well, I was a Marine for 12 years, realized they said they kicked me out, started cooking, hated cooking. And now I help companies ethically scale. He's like, okay, cool. Like, how do you do that? And I was like, oh, I do this, 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 this is awesome. He's like, I see you got CrossFit shoes on, you CrossFit? I'm like, yeah, I love CrossFit. He's like, oh, cool. I was like, yeah, I started in Afghanistan. He's like, I got a question. I'm like, yeah. He's like, what do you think about the whole like Reebok CrossFit thing? I was like, I think it was a stupid fucking move. <laughs> and he looked at me, he's like, why? I'm like, because I think their intention was good. I think they thought that if they decked out all the athletes, the women with the eight packs, the dudes that are like unattainable, that people would get enrolled in it, the mom and pops in the CrossFit gyms would buy it. And I was like, but I think what happened is they alienated their entire Rockport crowd and their 55 plus ran away and they lost a shit ton of money. And he looked me square in the eye and said, yeah, I lost $1.1 billion. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I'm the CEO of Adidas. I'm like, okay. And he's like, we own Reebok. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, but while you're at it, What'd you think about the UFC deal? I was like, oh, that one was way worse. <laughs> I was like, dudes used to be able to walk around with condom depot on their ass and make a living. And I was like, and then you made it so they could only make $1,500 a fight, couldn't get sponsorship and couldn't support their families. 
So you created an anti-marketing machine and all of them voided their contracts, went on social media and said how much Reebok sucks and it fucked over the UFC. He's like, yeah, I lost 1.5 on that one. And I was like, God. I was like, how do you sleep at night? He's like, I still made seven. And I was like, holy shit. And he's like, but that's why I want to talk to you. He's like, I made that decision in a room full of whiteboard members. And he was very honest with it. And no matter what, we still got our bonuses, we got our retirement and we get to stop. No one was connected, nobody gave a shit and nobody thought about those guys, their families, the CrossFitters or anything else. And he's like, so you come talk to my board? I'm like, done, game over. That's how I got hired by Adidas. And I should not have got paid what I got paid. But I was- Is this still ongoing? Uh, no, we did, a, we did a one off for them. I'm still ongoing with On It, Vital Proteins. Um, I was with Men's Health until Rodale sold to Hearst. You know, so Hearst can build a digital empire and monopoly since they've been buying every digital publication that exists. Um, but yeah, and it, and really like when I look back at it, I could have sat there and if I knew who he was, I wouldn't have said anything differently. Like I would have said the same exact thing, why I said it and kind of been unapologetically authentic because those decisions affected people on the other line. It affected athletes, it affected UFC fighters, it affected infants and kids and wives and families. And I was like, we need to think through that stuff. And I am still like, holy fuck, I got hired by Adidas. I'm like, I don't know why. And that's the imposter syndrome, but I acknowledge it and I just keep going. But it was, it was pretty monumental. Yes. Uh, just going back to Microsoft and mm -hmm. you focus on the 90% that mm -hmm. fall away and go back, why would you not yeah. purchase all that stuff? Love all of that in theory. Want to understand it better in practicality. Yeah. I, there's only so much time in the day and you can't chase down every single no. Why? And, uh, well, all right. <laughs> That's and a limiting then, belief. And, and I'm saying this because we're friends. Uh, that's totally okay. Um, well, okay, to answer that, why uh, limiting belief, there are people that when you know that they're not the right fit, so I'm not going to sit on a phone trying to convince them, oh, we're a good fit if we're not a good fit. So I don't want to convert every no because it's probably a good no. I don't want you to convert every no. I don't want anybody to convert every no. Sure. I was like, that's not the point. But don't advertise to them because not everybody's gonna say yes. What we do and what we advertise, we have to be ready to support the yeses and support the noes. And that's where everybody drops the ball. Not everybody, most people drop the ball. So how many, how many in here have like Facebook pages, like business pages, cool. How many of you would love to have 300,000 fans? How many of you would love to do a live video and get 11,000 live viewers? 5.1 million views on a video. 6,000 comments, cool. How many of you would respond to every comment? Ask me why I'm sitting here. It took me 11 hours and I responded to every fucking comment. It also made me $210,000. Those aren't no's, those are still prospects. Most of them were no's. They were just commented on a video and I said, and I made the mistake. <laughs> in the video of saying, if you guys ask me a question, I promise you I will get back to you. I didn't expect that when I talked about being sexually abused and bulimic while talking about a food blog that I would get five million views on a video. I made my bed, I got to sleep in it. That single-handedly changed my business. And we had that rule in my business and we still have that rule and Jeremy's the one who feels the pain now. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that money come from in that, in that 200,000? That video, um, I had a couple, I had a, I did a digital, digital membership product and um, it was like monthly access or, or lifetime access. And I barely mentioned it in the video, but every time I messaged somebody, I answered their question like, where can I spend more time with you? And I'm like, well, you can just watch my Facebook page. And they're like, no, 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 like more one-on-one. -on -one. I'm like, well, I have this membership. And so uh, it very passively, you know, like Jordan style, they were like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And I, I didn't hard sell anybody. Like I made it very clear, like, nope, <laughs> you don't have to come in. Like, this is fine. I'll be here tomorrow. I'll do a video tomorrow. Cause I live streamed every day for nine months. I never missed a day. Um, and so that, that, was, that was pretty insane. And then since then I've kept that context of like, if you take time out of your day, so you have this feed, you have this phone, we wake up in the morning, Jim calls us all out. Right, normally like a minute within waking up, one of us is on one of our favorite platforms for that dopamine hit, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And I call 2018 the year of discernment. We have so much marketing and so much advertising and so many things going on that we're all competing for attention. I take that seriously when somebody chooses, 
in their 6 a.m. scroll, first thing out of bed, to take the time to comment on my photo. And I'm like, you're paying more attention to me than your husband. Okay, cool, I'm gonna respond. And, and that, that's a very, very important to me because I basically am saying I care enough about you to acknowledge you, I hear you, I see you, and I'm here to support you. But how many of you have ever like been on social media, and I, I, I do this all the time, and you're like, are on an influencer page, or on a Facebook page, or on a blog, and you ask a question, and they never respond, right? How many of you go back and ask another question? Never. You train your customers how to be your customers. That's a very important thing to remember. You train people that when they comment, when you don't respond, that they are not important, that they're unheard, and quite frankly, in the personal development world, I don't care enough about you to respond. And that's not a bad thing, it's just something to be acknowledged because on the opposite side of it, when you do respond, you now are one out of 100, where they may comment on 85 people's stuff that day, and you were the one that wrote back. So who are they gonna comment on tomorrow? Who are they gonna message? Who are they gonna email back? Who are they gonna DM? And so I just think, and, and listen, this isn't like perfection. I'm not like a fucking relationship saint. If you saw my marriage, you'd be like, Jesus. That's why I'm good at marketing, because I work on it every day. I take the feedback, I listen to it. I'm humble and I adjust and it fucking hurts. And that's a good thing. It keeps me very uncomfortable. And I do the same thing in our marketing, right? Like we do these things, we launch funnels, we launch a product, we do an email, like, oh, nobody clicked on it, screw it, I'm building another funnel. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, or you could just ask people why they didn't click on it and then change it. So what does that look like? Perfect example, I had a, one, of my, one of my coaching students uh, sells a personal development course for $2,500 and she built this massive, I mean massive funnel. She had a three-part video series to an order form, retargeted to a webinar, because I taught her how to do ethical retargeting, retargeted to a webinar, and then everybody kind of went through, and she had an email list of like 88,000 people, and she launched this funnel, and basically five promotion emails with an affiliate launch, probably, probably put 10 to 12,000 people's eyeballs on that page and made like 300, $400 from basically the front end offer and nobody bought the back. And she's like, I quit. I'm like, no, I'm like, you're focusing on what doesn't matter. And I was like, how have you closed people? And she's like, people respond the best on the phone, like instant teleseminar. Cause she's like one of those old school personal development relationship gurus. I'm like, cool, I have an idea. I'm like, I want you to do a instant teleseminar call every single day for five days and then give everybody a link to schedule a calendar invite for you in 15 minute calls. I want you to delete your funnel. I want you to start your Facebook group and I want you to get a PayPal button. And you're not allowed to build a funnel until you make a million bucks. It only took her like 68 days. She just kept doing phone call after phone call after phone call. And every time somebody said yes, she manually processed them on PayPal and added them to the group. And added them to the group and I said, all right, cool. She passed a million in like 68 days. I was like, you wanna do that funnel now? And she's like, nope. I'm like, oh, what are you gonna do? She's like, I'm doing more phone calls. I'm like, perfect, right? And so like we overcomplicate it because a marketer said to do it. We saw Russell Brunson close fucking $17 million from ClickFunnels stage or 10X to the Grant Cardone, right? And we see a lot of these people do all these things and they're like, this is the tactic, this is the strategy. Uh, the context matters, the fact that they've been building that relationship for 12 years or all the other back end stuff that's there. And I feel like if you always focus on that relationship, like thinking through that entire process of like how they could feel or what's gonna make them take that action or how you can enroll them in their vision and you keep it as personal as possible, then you will be able to make it work. And then when the time is right, you can put basically implementations in place with optimizing and automating and outsourcing the things that don't require the human connection and then you keep building the relationships and it keeps going. Because if I asked in here, like how many of you would want no overhead in your business? No like, fuck, I think the most I paid a month, I was paying like nine grand a month just for my email list and a fucking like funnel software. So I had like 677,000 emails and I deleted the whole thing and I started over. I got 21,000 people now. That shit was clean. I was like, guys, I love you. 
I was like, but this is expensive and I want to start over and you are welcome to stay. Here's a gift to go. Here's a new email address. Let's go again. And I tell marketers that and they have like heart attacks. Yeah. They're like 677,000. I'm like, yeah. And I was like, but I get to focus on like what matters and, and what's good. So I think how you do it isn't as important as why you do it and like what you're focusing on. And when you create results for people, it is unstoppable, like legitimately unstoppable. We see these funnels like Lady Boss is a perfect example. Her name's Kaylin Toll. She's on ClickFunnels and she, she sells a women's weight loss product or fitness product. And literally it's a web app on your phone. It's either $37 a month or $197 for unlimited access. And it is one of the ugliest sales pages I've ever seen. It is bright pink. Everything is pink. Everything is video and like yelling at me and like rah, 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 rah. And it was like, God, she did 15 million in two years. And I was like, yeah, totally. I'm like, but nobody's buying because of the sales page or the videos. It's because of she's being connected and getting them enrolled in their vision. And she's very, very authentic. I was overweight. I was this, I was lost. I was everything. Shares our story. It creates permission for people. My open loop in my marketing brain still remembers I have to talk about safety and accountability. Creates permission for people makes them feel okay through her story and they feel safe to take an action. And then once they feel safe, you look at her testimonials and her pages, it is not like swimwear models or Instagram models. It is like Jane Smith, single mom at home with three kids covered in spit up, posting a before and after like, I love my life. And it creates that safety for other women to come in, get the accountability and create the results that they want. She's done like 15 million on a $37 a month product and a 197 lifetime access in two years with one Facebook ad. One, one, yeah, everybody should, I like Justin, no, yeah. yeah. What do you mean by accountability in this sense? You sell a product, a program, you ensure that when somebody joins it that you set them up to win. Whether it's your fulfillment sequence, the, the customer journey that you lay out, right? I, I find that a lot of people like we'll sell like a 12 week course, right? And so everybody thinks through, come in on day zero, end on week 12, that's our customer journey. No, your customer journey is the lifetime of your customer. And you need to think through that entire lifetime because when they finish something, there's something more for them or more accountability or, or more results and you need to think through that entire journey. So like when we map out like customer journey since like, oh, I'm selling an eight week course. I'm like, cool. I'm like, where are they gonna be in 365 days? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, then don't launch it. How many of us only want customers for 12 weeks? How many of us design our products to only keep customers for 12 weeks? If you don't have a plan, there's no context for them to go somewhere or way for them to get there. And so accountability is, completing them, getting them. When somebody comes to you, they're in their before state. They're like, hey, I wanna lose weight. I want a, a better mindset. I wanna learn something on a television show. I wanna do all these things. And then our job is to build the bridge to get them to their after state. That's like dating your wife. Then you get married and that's when the real work happens. How do you keep her or him? You have to court them, you have to date them, you have to nurture them. You have to listen to them. You have to take their feedback and give them results. And you have to think through that journey. Yeah, they right? say no a lot. Huh? They say no a lot. Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. They do. And I, I mean, I'm still married, but when, when we think about it, what, what typically happens, I gave this talk at CHS, Joe remembers. I still, it was a good one. He talked about me for 30 minutes when I was done. I'll answer your question in a minute. Um, <laughs> but I gave this talk and what typically happens is we take people that come into our our ecosystem or into our business. They are on our email list, they don't buy. So what do we do? We take care of the buyers, we email the buyers, and then they all get dropped in like this newsletter sequence. And what do we do? We send them to like the creepy neighbor, the old man in the candy van. Here's an affiliate offer, buy from my friend. Let me pass you off this pedophile next door. Right, like he's gonna make you an offer and he's gonna close you and he's really gonna take care of you, right? Or they finish a course after 12 weeks and literally they're out for a day and they get a sales email from you. Hey, it's time to buy again. Fuck you. Seriously. 
Like, how many of you would walk into a store, buy a product, and then stand there, and then them give you another product of the same exact thing, and then give them your credit card again? You're like, yo, I still got 24 bottles of water to drink. <laughs> like, can, can you wait till I'm done? Or can you support me in, in like that, that journey? So we just, and I use it like as an extreme example, because it does happen. We see it all the time, right? It's normally the people that aren't in our masterminds, or aren't in Genius, or aren't in our stuff, because it's like, let's make a buck. Let's sell again, let's sell again, let's sell again. Hey, it's like a good, a good measure is to make a dollar per email per month on your list. So we just gotta sell, 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 sell. I'm like, great. And I'm like, and you're getting transactions, not transformations. And when you transform somebody's life, it changes your business. Because it's intended for the right reasons to have the right impact. And it gives you all the ingredients you need to make that successful recipe. Right, you go to like any Michelin, three-star Michelin restaurant, two-star Michelin restaurant, you look and you're like, oh, the menu's the same as that guy. Why are they a three-star and why are they a B in the rating window in New York City that you want to avoid like the plague? The recipe's the same. The customer experience, the customer journey, the level of detail, the care, the thought, the preparation, everything that goes into it is what creates and nurtures that experience and it's never about the product, ever. It's never about the ingredients on the plate, nor how it looks. It's how it tastes. And everyone's like, oh yeah, well you cook it the same. I'm like, no. I'm like, your food doesn't taste that way because of how they cook it. It tastes that way because of how you felt when you walked through the door, what you saw on the walls, what you smelled when you walked in, what you heard for the noise, how the server talked to you, how quick your food came. All of that control your experience, which are all the factors that we have when we look at digital funnels, when we look at paid media, when we look at email marketing, we control 24 seven how people feel in our ecosystem. Yes? I think you just asked a question. So it doesn't matter the product, it doesn't matter the video. So you don't have a say. You're saying it's not about what we're selling. No. Like the pink video, you say everything was pink, so you never told her, can you change it like that? No. It, there's okay. this myth, right? How many times have we all heard like ugly pages convert? It's not because of the fucking page. So it doesn't have to be perfect. No, it's because of the audience and the offer. That's what it's about. The page doesn't matter. You can give 25 people a hammer and a set of blueprints and you're gonna get 25 different looking houses. Because it's not the hammer that matters. It's just a tool. That's all it is. A funnel is a tool, an email is a tool, and, and most of the time a product is a tool. It's a tool to get somebody from their before to their after. And your sale happens before they hit your sales page. Every single time. So you, you talked about doing sequencing a while mm -hmm. ago on the front end. So a lot of what you do is the front end experience to help the back end. No, 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 I start with the back end oh. and then we go to the front end. So on that front end, not just the nose, but the sequencing, whether it be quizzes or however you get them into your yep. bucket. Um, how often does your sequencing change? Because sometimes you said you've like written out the Brazil. We've done, I did a, you, you yeah, saw me in Miami, six. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we did, I mean like, the example you're talking about is I, I tested this theory, I sold a $27 product and I wrote 365 fulfillment emails. And I said, on a $27 product, I'm gonna email you every day for 365 days. That's exactly what you're talking about. And so for everyone that wasn't in Miami, um, we put 12,100 people through that. We averaged a 71% open rate and a 41% click-through rate. We only lost, and I say lost because I feel like I lost my people, of the 12,100 people, we only lost 210 people over the course of a year. That's exactly what you're talking about. So when I look at that, um, really the question is now, how often am I auditing it? What adjustments am I making? And I base that all on feedback, right? So we're entrepreneurs, we're business owners. This is what typically happens. Ton of CEOs and C-suite in this room. Vision, like we're fucking excited, like this guy. He is like an excitement monster, right? Like here we go, I got a new idea, I got a blah, 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 blah. And then it goes straight to execution, right? We miss the entire part that helps us run a business, which is the plan, which is what we measure, how we measure it, how we know if it works, how we know if it doesn't work, how we know what to change, what to audit. And if we don't do that, we have no idea what controls or variables are there are creating our success. We have 17 ads running to three different variable sales pages to a product and none of it's being measured, right? So to answer that question, it's a lot more in depth of like, you know, 
How are you measuring it? How is it set up? What measurements do you think of? And Mackenzie actually gave the best example of this. We were consulting together. And that's a question we get all the time. How do you measure? How do you measure? How do you measure? Measurement is whatever you want to measure. And she's like, I made up the McKenzie unit for her dad, who is a math teacher. But the truth was it could be open rate, it could be click-through rate. You could have a low threshold and you're like, no matter what, I'm okay as long as this gets a 50% open rate or I'm okay as long as I get 11 responses for every email that goes out or I'm okay as long as I get 26 clicks. It's whatever we decide to measure. And so for me, I measure feedback all the time. We create open loops in our emails all the time because I actually want people to respond, right? Like, I love copywriters. I've never used one, ever. All I do is I ask questions. I basically bait people. I ask for their opinions. I ask them what their pain points are. I copy every single one of their answers and then I paste it on my sales page. I use the language of the pain points of my prospective customers. I don't try to make it pretty. I don't try to make it all this shit. I use the exact words that they use. They're like, I can't lose weight because my dog ate my homework. Cool. Hey, are you struggling to lose weight because your dog ate your homework? Awesome. I can help you. Right? And the only way that we do that is we, we ask questions. We build engagement. We build two-way relationships as much as possible, whenever possible, as long as somebody responds. And that means responding to every email, responding to DMs, responding to comments. But one of the principles that I teach in marketing is that everything we do needs to be learning or serving. And if it doesn't check one of those boxes, there's no point in doing it. Because you're either learning about your audience, you're learning about their pain points, you're learning about their needs, or you're serving those needs and those things that you learn. And if you're not doing it, you're just wasting time, dollars, and opportunity. And so via email, to give you an example, is one of the things that we do is like when I'm working with clients and we're delivering an ebook or a video course, that first email, I'm not like, hey, whitelist me. I'm like, hey, like, thank you so much for trusting me with your time. And I'm glad that I gave you the three secrets to, you know, effective weight loss in seven days, or whatever bullshit somebody's trying to sell on the internet. And I'm like, but I would love to know, like, there's a reason that you found me and there's a reason you downloaded this. What's the biggest struggle that you've had up until this point? and I will personally respond to your email. And they write back in droves. I haven't lost weight because of this. I haven't lost weight because of accountability. I can't do it because nobody supports me. I can't figure out the right meals to eat or the right macros. We write all of it down. We put it in a massive document and then we respond to every single person. And we're like, oh my God, that's so amazing. Like I totally struggle with that as well. That's why we have this free Facebook group. And is there anything else that we can help you with? So we're doing what most people do in bucket surveys once every six months or once every 12 months, every single day. Every day the feedback is coming in, every day we're writing it down, every day we're adjusting, every day we're then serving, and most of the time, the responses that we get to email one are the things that we copy and paste in email two and email three, and we're like, oh God, like, I can't believe we didn't think of this. Like, are you struggling like, to lose weight because of X, Y, and Z? And then email two solves that problem and then email three solves the next problem. And we're basically using everything that they tell us to create their journey, to create that permission and safety for them to join our program, to join our group, to buy our product, to change their results. Is that helpful? Cool. I love you, Justin. Love you too. Good, I had a, a question. Um, I didn't even give you one. This is a real one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, like, I heard you speak in Miami and I, I'm hearing you speak now, and um, like I love, I love the content and the ideas, and yeah. the excitement about it. Uh, and I also hear your commitment to uh, to taking care of people, and just a commitment to uh, to leaders uh, being committed. To them, yeah, right? yeah, for sure. So I just, I, I want to know, like, what what's the world that you're creating? Like, what's the world that you're committed to? Safety. Safety. No fault, no blame, no guilt, no shame. That's it. There's enough of that shit. Like enough, right? Like the reason I stand up here and I tell my story, I'm like, oh, I was sexually abused and I was this and I was this and I was this and I was this, is like, I don't fucking care what happened. But it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't define who you are. You don't have to walk around with your head down with fault, blame, guilt, or shame because I want my son to grow up in a different world. 
I don't want him to be ashamed because daddy did things that he did or pulled the trigger in Afghanistan. I want him to be proud that like I stood for something in this fucking world. And like I gave people an option to create the life that they love, regardless of what they went through, whether it's addiction or pain or abuse. And we have this fucking internet where everybody's on and everybody's just trying to make a fucking buck and nobody's trying to make a difference. And I don't say nobody, like I'm not judging anybody in this room, but outside of this room, most of it's a ton of hypocritical bullshit and it further perpetuates the problems. And what do we do? We're like, hey, we gave you this because I want to give you results, but oh wait, you're not done yet. You need to buy this next thing so you can feel complete. Hey, fuck you. How about I make you feel complete and then you're like, I'm going to give you my money forever. I'm like, that's the world I want to fucking live in. Like, that's where I want to go. I want to go back to like the days of the 50s when you walk in the fucking butcher and he knows your name and knows your order, knows your family, knows your kids and actually gives a shit. And most of the time you walk in just to have a conversation and never buy anything. That's the world that I want to live in. And I'm a horrible fucking CEO. My wife fired me four weeks ago. I'm a pain in the ass because I suck at leading people. I'm horrible. I was really good at leading Marines because they couldn't fucking quit. <laughs> I, what? We had two choices. Win, die. Cool, let's fucking win. I hate you. Cool, me too. Let's get home. And that's not a bad thing. Like I feel like, and I love when Jordan said it, right? I literally call myself self-aware all the time because I want to convince myself that I am so I can constantly take a look at what's happening and why it's happening. But I feel like there's so many fucking egos that exist in business and marketing and all of these things. And it's the biggest problem that I run into with my consulting, right? Like I get these Fortune 50, like in three weeks, I'm giving a fucking keynote to the CEOs of all the Fortune 50 companies in the world. And I'm gonna dye my mohawk blue again and I'm gonna walk in there in a fucking hoodie and board shorts and be like, let's go. And it's so much ego and like commitment to being right versus commitment to making a difference. And I said this to Courtney outside. One of the biggest lessons that I ever learned is that when I'm right, everybody else is wrong. When I'm wrong, everybody else is right. And I'm willing to be wrong for everybody else to be right, feel right, and make a difference. And we do that in our marketing. We do that in our messaging. We do that in our videos and in our ads. Ethical scarcity is a real thing, but it's not like, hey, the price goes up in six hours and then fucking six weeks later, it's the same price. Come on. Like I want a world that's honest and safe and people don't feel like they're bad or wrong or they have guilt and shame or fault and blame for being who they are, for saying no to our products, for not being in his course, for not joining my mastermind or for not hiring me as a consultant. I want that to be okay. So. Thanks for asking that question. Do you do offline stuff? Huh? Do you do offline stuff? All the time. All the time. I have clients that have 86% retail and 14% digital, but all of it's the same. And I didn't need, I used, I used to think marketing was special. Like really, I really did. But marketing is nothing more than successful relationships. That's it. And I'm really good at it because I suck at being in relationships. So I have to work really hard at those and then I apply the same principles to marketing. Can you give me a few examples of offline campaigns you did? Yeah, like the perfect offline company examples are always about user experience, right? Anything from like in-store demos to when somebody picks your product up off the shelf, right? Like we see people all the time, they sell a product in a store and they like have something in a company or um, they're like, hey, go to this website, you know, to do this or scan this QR code. Don't use QR codes. Um, or any of those things, but we don't think about like, not we, but a lot of people don't think about like, somebody buys a product because they want the product, but why did they choose that product? Like what are they looking for and what are they going for? And then how do we further enhance that experience? So like one of my favorite things to do is to take companies with a physical presence and create a digital presence. So we can create like a multiple touch point or multiple modality situation, right? So like we have a store, we have a product, um, one, of, one of my companies, we're in Costco, Whole Foods, uh, basically everywhere, Target, everywhere else, and they're supplements. And people don't buy this supplement online. It's literally exclusive to the stores. And I was like, cool, but how do we build community? And so we went really aggressive with in-store demos. We were giving out free samples and we created this entire like 60 day 
digital journey for people that bought a physical product. And so we made the product so it had a redemption code. And all we wanted to do is create community to create consumption habits, to know that we're here, to know that we care. So when you walk into the store again, and you're like walking down the aisle and you're looking at how people made you feel, thanks to Maya Angelo, you're like, okay, there's 87 products here, but I see that one because that one cared about me. And not everybody does that. Like not everybody clicks on the link that's on the packaging or, or goes through that experience. And so then I'm like, all right, cool. Have we done our due diligence? And we're like, no. So then we get into geo-targeting on Facebook. And then we'll grab the customer list from our retailer and we'll figure out like how many went, when it went and the time frame. And then we'll run basically Facebook ads or retargeting with free content, with free value to build community with absolutely zero return to further enhance that experience and we make it a part of our marketing budget, right? And so we continue to do that. And then I was like, cool, have we done our due diligence enough? And we're like, I don't know. And so then I had the CEO record a video that said happy birthday. And then we ran a Facebook ad to all of our competitors in the store on their birthdays from the CEO of our company wishing them a happy birthday. And then we said, if you respond, we'd send you a message and a coupon because we appreciate you whether you're a customer or not. And so I constantly think through like, when we're competing for attention in this digital world and in this physical world, what can we do to make a difference? Why is somebody gonna choose to marry me over the next person or date me over the next person? And I just make sure that we think through what that journey could be so we can solve the problems. Okay, so I think we take one more question, but then I wanna be respectful to our host. Perrin. You all right, Pear? Yeah. yeah. I'm good. Pear and I have a ping pong game to be had after this. <laughs> Rematch. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, George will be here tomorrow, too, obviously. So oh, We can stay here one all more, night. Yeah, easily. I told you guys I love to hear myself talk. One more question. Good stuff. Yeah. Ooh. One more question. Malti. I was, I was thinking about, uh, I, was, I was actually talking to Perrin because he's been a great host. And I'm, I'm, I know you're awesome. So if he's guys are around for like four months, what, what could you do like in two minutes right now just to, you know, hack the shit out of Paris stuff so we will get crazy value back from lending us this great house? Like you mean, well, I don't, I'll give you a day. You don't need two minutes. I have your address. Look at my calendar when I'm open. I'll come up here for a day. For free. Is that, is that a serious offer? I'm not joking. Oh, me too. Damn. No, no, you can pay me. I'll let you win. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you win the ping pong game. <laughs> yeah, but that, but then that's not fair. No, I'll do it even though you beat me. No, seriously, I'll come spend a half day with you. We do a call, whatever, whatever you need. Yeah, because I can't sing, so other people need to be good at it. So can we have a can we have a real question? Yeah. So how do you take you take all this, right? This yeah. This is like your unique ability to see all these things. Maybe. And then, well, or I'm just opinionated. Yeah. Um, so. Look at that, right? and like obviously, like you know, for me working with Ari, like I don't think people have my coaches hire. Right? We we broken all that down. You like, help me with some of those things. Like how do you process? How do you create that optimized audience outsource to what you're talking about, which is scale humans? Yeah. And your unique ability of like seeing trends, patterns, and not being a douche at the same time. Not being a douche is always the goal. It's the hardest part. Yeah, it t totally. Yeah. I get I get douche sometimes. Joe, Joe was in my talk. I got about 15% douche, about 85% you made a difference. So I totally get that. Um, you know, when I, when I really, really look at it, and, and that's an amazing question, like how do you really look at this to, to kind of balance everything, create the process, create the customer journey? Um, the, the magic that I always go to is that I always ask, like, and th this is kind of funny, but like how many of us have ever gotten like customer service complaints? Like I hate you, you give me my money back. We get them, they, they happen, they happen for clients. And so those are my favorite things ever because then I look up their account and I call them on the phone. I'm like, hey, it's George. I'm like, I saw your comment. And they're like, oh shit. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. You probably really don't think I'm an asshole, but I would love to know what's going on. Like, how can I help you? How can I support you? How can I serve you? And the feedback that I get on those things are absolutely invaluable. And so there does become a point of diminishing return. Like there are only, like my consulting business can only go so far because I only have so much time. And so I travel a lot. I've flown 134 times in the last 12 months. Like it's fucking exhausting. I can't do it forever. I have a family, I have a kid. So we're gonna build an event space in my hometown that everybody's gonna come to me. But then I'm still gonna run out of dates. 
Like I'm still going to run out of the ability because I have the maximum capacity of doing 365 14 hour days and that's capacity. And it's a very, very real thing. And this is still a lesson that I'm learning and Ari's writing a book called The Replaceable Founder. And I believe that like everything can be replicated and everything can be done to a point where you can continue to scale. Because what I do may be unique or may not. I might just package it, be really, really charismatic and overly confident and people pay me for it. Or it might be unique, but I don't know. But I'm just constantly looking at like what, what are like the, the common variables, which is how I came up with like seven principles that I always lie back on when it comes to marketing. Um, and I'm trying to figure out which ways I can take those things and take the things off my plate that don't require my full attention or aren't necessarily my skill set so I can scale my coaching. And I know what you do, right? And so like, to be quite frank, I don't know if you can train anybody to have your personality, your intuition and see what you do. You can train people to get really, really close to where you just have to provide some QA and oversight, but that will always have a limit. Just like the best coaches in the world have a limit, just like even, I mean, and even Tony Robbins has a limit, right? Like he's fucking insane. He's in his sixties and he, he goes and he biohacks the shit out of himself, but that's on his main stuff, but he still only personally takes X amount of coaching clients on a million dollar a year retainer. Right, and so everybody kind of has that ceiling. And so you can empower trainers and coaches to handle anything that you can't, but eventually you're gonna hit to a point where like you just can't scale anymore. Facebook's never gonna have seven and a half billion users. Not everyone on the planet's always gonna be on Facebook. They have a limit, Amazon has a limit. It doesn't seem like that. It's like, fuck, Bezos like owns the world, um, but they do have an upper limit. And so as long, I feel like as long as you do your due diligence, you add your value, you think through your customer journeys and you figure out your capacity model, then you'll have what you need and at least you'll know like where you're going so you can succeed. And if it doesn't look good to you or it doesn't feel good to you, then make another plan. Adjust the model, adjust the coaching, adjust what you do to then create a win-win for people. Like you might very well hit a spot where you can't do one-on-one -on -one coaching anymore. That's, that's probably gonna happen. And then you're like, cool, I gotta do five. And then you have to create that experience, create that value and create that personalization at scale so that they can have the results that you've been given to one-on-one, -on -one, which is gonna require you to be that driven individual that gets really fucking uncomfortable because it's really easy at one and it sucks at five. And that's just a very, very real thing. And so, and I think about this every day. Like I went outside earlier and laid at the grass because I was having a fucking panic attack from my PTSD. But like two years ago, I would have fucking punched a wall and disappeared. And so I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> all right, well, I don't have an MDMA with me, so I'm gonna go outside and just sit in the grass and take a breath. I'm gonna process through it. But like, it was because I'm so booked and like, so, like I, I looked at my calendar, like it's like fucking September and oh my God, I miss my family, right? And so like, I'm just constantly self-aware about it and looking at it, like how I can increase the model. I was talking to Mac about it. I talked to him about it two days ago. We talk about consulting together, how we can scale both and have a bigger impact. And so I just feel like everybody should constantly be in this state of discovery of like, what's the possibility? What's the win-win and how do we make a difference? And we're gonna, hit a, we're gonna hit capacity. And so just keep doing what you're doing and you know, adjust as you go. It's scary. It's not always like this perfect recipe that makes this perfect result at the end. But the most important part is that we just keep going. Right, we keep going, we keep going, because you make a difference, you make a difference, like he makes a difference, Joe makes a difference, Luke makes, like everybody in here makes a difference. And the more that we stop thinking about it and we just focus on what that value is and who those people are and what we're doing, that impact is immeasurable and it will keep going and we'll figure the rest out as we go. And then if not, we have a shit ton of awesome people in this fucking room that can give us the answers that we can't see. So, thank you. No, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Less Doing podcast. At Less Doing, we help entrepreneurs who have opportunity in excess of what their infrastructure can support to set up systems and processes that empower a team to ultimately make themselves more replaceable. That way they can optimize, automate, and outsource everything in their businesses in order to be more effective. If you want to find out more about Less Doing, the podcast, the blog, the books, and all of the wonderful programs we offer to help you get from where you are to where you know you want to be. 
go to lessdoing.com slash podcast and check out our OAO blueprint so you can get started today.